session in which I will host the managing director, CEO of the Nigeria LNG, Mr. Tony Atta, at a fire. Hey, Tony. Great. All right. Let me start the Nigeria LNG model and how it is one of the most viable models for investment in the industry in Nigeria. Now, tell us, what exactly is this model? What are the differences between the NLNG model and the joint venture model in the industry? And why, in your opinion, has it been so successful and so much talked about? Can you still hear me okay, uh, Frank? <clears throat> I'm hearing, yeah. you, I'm hearing you well, yes. Uh, yeah, okay, I think uh, you have asked uh, what is a bundle of questions that is, seems like three questions in one, but all uh, linked to the NLNG model. Uh, this is a model that has uh, been very successful. Uh, I must confirm that it is also a joint venture because you asked to sort of differentiate between this model and the uh, popular joint ventures we JV. know about JV. upstream. I think the major difference is really a combination of the NLNG model structure, the governance, uh, the accountability uh, entrenched in the model, uh, the transparency element, and uh, by far, most importantly, independence, because I will talk about interference and the value that uh, has given to this particular model. Now, the typical joint venture models upstream, you have uh, unincorporated, which essentially means that they are not registered legal entities. Uh, whereas the NLNG model, the joint venture is incorporated. And I will uh, explain what this means. In the incorporated model like that of NLNG, the joint venture itself is the business and it is the company. Whereas in the unincorporated joint venture, similar to what you have upstream, the joint venture is the business. The companies are different. However, those companies have agreed to come together to run a business, which is the joint venture. They collectively will typically appoint one of the companies to run the business on behalf of the others. Now that is the difference. In the case of the NLNG model, structurally, the joint venture itself is the company, the business is the company. The shareholders are different from the company. And I think from that uh, 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 explanation, you already start to see the differences. In the case of the upstream, the average uh, equity holdings there is about 57% for government. Of course, you have some that are 60, 40, uh, 60, 20, 20, uh, as in the case of the SPDC joint venture of 55 for NNPC. Um, but in the case of NLNG model, NNPC is the single largest shareholder there with 49%, but then you have three IOCs, uh, Shell with 25.6, Total, and uh, Total 15, and ENI. Now the IOCs are a combined majority of 50 with 51 percent versus NMPC is 49 and you can already start to see the differentiation whereas upstream predominantly uh, NMPC on behalf of government is the is the major shareholder with average 57 percent equity again when it comes to funding which has been a major issue upstream every partner would have to contribute its equity fund so in the case of the entire upstream, uh, you will see in the JVs, government is required to contribute 57% of the cost of running that business. And if you look at the current realities of government's uh, uh, funds, then you see that the upstream uh, continues to struggle. Whereas in the case of the NLNG model, the company as a legal entity is licensed to fund itself so the company goes out to the market to raise funds. Of course, in the very early days, the shareholders uh, put in money, about $5.5 billion. 
which has since been paid back. That was a loan that has since been paid back and the company is clearly independent today. I think so, we don't have cash calls. We don't have cash call issues because we're self-funding, whereas in the upstream, because everybody's contributing into the port, you have this uh, cash call. I think around governance, uh, the company is managed by management, uh, senior executive, uh, managing director, deputy managing director, reporting to a board, and that's it. So the board is the ultimate governance uh, body of the company. So I, myself and my deputy report into the board and we are left to manage the business. So there's little interference, you know, in terms of the day-to-day -day operation uh, of, of the business. But I think one key difference is around the accountability and transparency element. Now we have our own standalone balance sheet, standalone uh, P&L accounts, um, and to the extent that on an annual basis, we actually publish every cent that we earn. Every dividend we have paid, we, have, we publish in what we refer to as our facts and figure book over the last 20 years. So that is available. I think that elements of transparency really drives accountability to the extent that this company is so successful that if we were a publicly quoted company, we will be about number 460 in the Fortune 500 uh, benchmarks that we have done. I think this particular model is very great. It offers you a lot of independence. It offers you a lot of transparency. It drives accountability, but most importantly, it limits interference. And I believe that is one of the key reasons why this model has been, has been shown to be very successful. And uh, no wonder people talk about it on a daily basis as you referenced. Well, Tony, thank, thank you so very much. Um... You have been very, very direct, very clear. Um, at some point, it seemed to me like I was sitting in a classroom uh, listening to a lecture, um, but you, you have broken it down. You've talked about the structure. You've talked about accountability and transparency. And um, another thing that I'm sure many of us did not know, you have also dimensioned uh, 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 the company in a global sense, uh, how high, if it were to be uh, 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 um, um, listed on, on, on a global stock exchange, for instance, uh, where it will be. Thank you so very much. Let me just ask you, and I'm sure you can deal with this very, very quickly. So in your view, what are the direct benefits of the LNG, the Nigeria LNG model uh, and, and, and its operation to the Nigerian nation? I think just picking back on the description I gave on the model, the real benefits would uh, be linked to the success of the company without a doubt. We have a vision to be a global LNG company on the one hand, on the other hand, to help build a better Nigeria. So this is an ambidextrous vision that our founding fathers pulled together over a long time. And you can see that globally, we continue to represent Nigeria in the marketplace. But on top of that, we have been adding value to not just our shareholders, but to the country itself. To date, in the last 20 years, we have earned more than $100 billion in revenue, out of which we have paid dividends. And I think it's the dividends that make the difference in terms of contribution to the nation on the right-hand side of helping to build a better nation. Over $18 billion of dividend has been paid uh, to the federal government, of course, through our, our uh, shareholder, NNPC, with 49% shareholding there. Another 15, 18%, 18 billion has also been paid to the other three IOCs. But on top of that, because we do not have our own gas resource, we buy gas. So essentially, we are an outlet for gas. We are a catalyst for gas development in, in, in the country to the extent that we have spent, we have bought gas worth over $15 billion from the federal government in the last 20 years. Indeed, initially we were tax exempt very early on, but since we became taxpayer, we have contributed $9 billion in taxes to the federal government. More than, more than, uh, more than anybody else in the country, we are by far the highest taxpayer in Nigeria. And I think that is the information that can be validated. But overall, we also contribute in the environmental space. Uh, prior to Nigeria LNG, Nigeria was number two 
on that ignominious league of gas flaring nation behind Russia, Russia is still number one. But today, because of Nigeria LNG offering that sink to receive whatever gas that should have been otherwise uh, fled, uh, offering the monetization opportunity, we have reduced Nigeria's gas flaring by more than 65% since 1999 to less than 12%, as you heard my colleague reference. Today, Nigeria is number seven in, on the League of Gas Flaring Nation, just because Nigeria LNG is available to take the gas and uh, monetize it on behalf of the country. As we speak, even the United States is flaring more than Nigeria. But most importantly, you can see that environmentally, we are making a big difference in terms of reducing flaring, saving the environment, but most importantly, monetizing it to earn money. Uh, we continue to make a big difference to our stakeholders, starting with our communities. And my colleague has touched on uh, the road we are partnering with the federal government to build, connecting Boni to, to Port Harcourt, uh, over $120 billion uh, billion naira road, and we are contributing 50% of that. But most importantly, we continue to support our communities based on four pillars of sustainable development around education first, health, of course, infrastructure, and youth development, which we believe will go a long way in answering the Niger Delta question, which I personally believe is tied to poverty and unemployment. And if you are able to deal with any, the other is taken care uh, uh, in, in, in itself, of itself. So unemployment is something we are tackling. And on the back of our trade seven projects, you will see a lot uh, happening there. Over 12,000 jobs will be created. More than $10 billion of uh, foreign direct investment coming into country. I mean, I can go on and on in terms of the value this company has brought to nation, but let me hold it there, recognizing that you will have a few more questions, uh, Frank. Well, th th thank you so very much. I mean, you know, um, it's good that um, uh, 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 you answered this question because um, over time we hear about how the Nigeria. LNG carries gas and takes it abroad. But I mean, the point that you've made about how much you have paid, almost $15 billion uh, for the gas that you take. So you just don't go there, dig the ground and then move the gas, move the gas away. And then of course, um, uh, we all celebrated uh, the um, uh, 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 um, start of the construction of the 120 billion naira uh, road uh, linking Boni to Port Haka. Uh, we believe it is, it is, it is a very uh, critical piece of infrastructure that you're building in terms of the ripple effect that it will have uh, across the nation. And then of course the um, significant uh, payment in, in uh, dividend, $18 billion to the federal government and $15 billion to the other three shareholders. And you are also denting uh, the uh, 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 environmental crisis that we have, moving Nigeria from the number two gas flaring nation um, to number seven gas flaring nation. Uh, uh, um, so thank you very much. So we are now ready for, uh, I believe, the next question, which is simply uh, to ask you what you consider uh, to be the key gas development and monetization challenges uh, that Nigeria faces today. Um, I think it's a question that I wish you had asked the, the minister, but to be fair, he's dealt with it uh, in, in his speech. Um, I want to first of all uh, appreciate our minister for being very bold on this subject and uh, the GMD for sort of following that leadership to say, we will deliver on gas. Um, essentially, we are not short of policies around gas. We are not short of guidelines. Mm. There are all sorts of opportunities mm. around gas. So it comes down to execution, but a lot of it will start from the commerciality of gas. I mean, you heard that we have 200 TCF of gas and that is perhaps the largest uh, gas uh, reserves in, in Africa. But we also in know of what is 600 TCF scope for recovery. So we know the 600 is there. We just need to prove it according to the SEC rules to be able to book that reserve. And that takes us to number four behind Turkmenistan. Today we are number nine. 
So it's really around that deliberateness of government to say it's time for gas. We as Nigeria LNG have said this so many times to the extent that we have a cliche that Nigeria has ridden on the back of oil for more than 50 years. And now it's time to fly on the wings of gas if we are to leapfrog to that next level that we so aspire for. But overall, you will be looking at infrastructure. You cannot achieve much without infrastructure. So I'm so glad to hear that the GMB uh, reference some of the infrastructure-based projects that the government is uh, embarking on, the famous AKK pipeline connecting uh, yep. the north, north to, uh, to south, uh, the OB3 connecting the east of, of the delta the to the western delta, the Alps, you had Alps 1, on, one to 2 taking gas from Niger Delta all the way to the entire the southwest. So you need a major network, a very robust infrastructure base to be able to harness the value of this uh, reserve that we talk about. You need social stability in terms of security of these assets. Today, we, we have a vandalization of assets impacting on uh, security of supply. Security of the assets is what will uh, actually guarantee security of supply. But I think in the end, the real question is around how can we attract investment into this space? We say it is a year of gas, but to be frank with you, in one year, you cannot achieve much uh, 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 to develop gas and become that gas nation that we really seek to be. That's we right. really must be bold to declare the decade of gas. And I think we declare the decade of gas and then establish a 10 year window within which the commerciality and the commercial framework that will enable Nigeria to harness the value of its gas resource and galvanize domestic gas to, to lead to that industrialization that we need has to happen. I like yes. the way the president of the NGA put it. I mean, she was very succinct. She says, gas is food, fertilizer, mm -hmm. gas. Gas is energy, power from yeah. gas. Gas yeah. jobs. I just talked of our trade seven that's going to give more than 12,000 direct jobs and if you talk to the jobs, executive yes. secretary of NCDMB, more than 40,000 indirect jobs from train seven. Gas is jobs. Amazing. Gas Amazing. is industrialization, she said. Gas indeed is sustainability. But most importantly, we recognize countries that have been able to do a lot with gas. Look at Qatar. Yes, they have some liquids which largely is condensate, is a byproduct of gas. But here we are with abundance of gas and we just need that regulatory and commercial framework to attract investment, to stabilize the sector and galvanize the development of gas to take us to that next level where we can actually experience gas as food, gas as jobs, gas as industrialization, gas as fertilizer, gas as petrochemicals uh, to make a difference to this country, especially in the face of uh, the changing energy mix globally. Thank you very much. Gas as food, gas as fuel, gas as catalyst for economic development, and of course, gas as cash. You didn't say that. Anyway, let me ask you. As you know, Nigeria is um, turning 60 in another two days. So what, in your view, um, should Nigeria be doing um, to harness the opportunities that abound in the sector and take advantage of them um, to become an even greater nation. I think it's related, uh, Frank. Uh, essentially, my sense will be around focus. You need the government to focus on this particular resource at this time. We have 200 TCF, and today we have 22 million tons per annum capacity at Nigeria LNG. Yes, of course, train seven will help us move by additional 35% of that capacity going to 30 million tons. But 30 million tons from 200 TCF is a non-starter. Australia today, we know has 128 TCF, but they have 88 million tons per annum capacity LNG, LNG plant. Malaysia has only 97 TCF. They have already about 29, 30 million tons. Uh, Indonesia, 103 TCF, 26 million tons. 
Mozambique that is coming is actually talking about 50 to 120 TCF only, but their ambition and starting point is 50 million tons per annum. So I think hmm. that deliberateness is very crucial. And as I mentioned upfront, it's not something you can achieve in one year. I think it's a major start that the Honorable Minister has declared the year of gas, but we need to be deliberate to say, this is the decade of gas. We want to focus on gas and we want to harness gas to its fullness, starting with the development in the domestic space, but also enabling the, uh, the NLNG uh, to be able to earn the money to finance the, the domestic. I've heard a lot of people say, oh, you are just taking the gas as you reference. No, we don't just take the gas. We buy the gas. We create opportunity by paying for the gas. But most importantly, we earn money. Mm -hmm. and, and on the back of that, we're able to support the country. But the country now needs to use that money to be deliberate in terms of how it develops the domestic gas. Without domestic gas uh, success, Precisely. that dream of industrialization will remain a dream. Power will remain a dream. But on top of all of this, I think the singular uh, requirement in my view is for government to be more deliberate and focus, focus on gas. Let us fly on the wings of gas. We, can, we see countries that have done it. We have the resource and I believe Nigeria can do it starting from this uh, age of 60. It's never too late. It's time for gas. Thank you. It's time for gas. As you know, Tony, the world is pivoting uh, into an era of cleaner uh, uh, fuel. We talk about gas today as fuel of the, of the future. So what is the implication of that for Nigeria? And what should Nigeria be doing using its gas resources in making this transition? both in terms of the way it lives and the way it makes its money? I think very excellent question, uh, Frank. If I just step back, uh, energy has been in transition forever. I mean, we talked about manpower. Uh, we talked about coal. We talked about steam. We talked about all forms of energies from the past, but we became very comfortable with the fossil fuel since its discovery uh, and never imagined that we will move away from fossil, fossil based fuel, which is why the energy transition of today is looking very sharp. But I must give a bit of dimension to that. Um, the world population is going to increase by 2 billion, but the world will move from 7 billion to 9 billion, essentially think about adding one more China, one more India to the already yeah. known population of the world today. So yeah. there will be demand. Where will the energy of the future come from? You know, this added population and the current one, where will the energy come from? I think it's a question around the transition. But then the world is also at risk. The world is threatened by climate change. Yeah. And that climate change is a big deal to the extent that science has pointed more to the fossil fuel as one of the risks associated with climate change. So essentially, even though the world needs energy, the world now wants it cleaner. And that is a challenge. Mm -hmm. But that challenge is big for coal, is big for oil. And it really underpins my statement that I'm not saying move away from oil, the oil will still be relevant in the mix but the focus will gradually move away. Whereas gas is mm -hmm. also a fossil fuel, gas is cleaner. But most importantly, gas is available, gas is available in abundance. So for me, it will seem a no brainer where we should be heading in terms of the energy transition. The world needs cleaner, mm -hmm. we have cleaner. So the conversation around, is it a year of gas or is it a decade of gas? Shouldn't even be a question. Mm. We need to start to position mm. today. And Frank, there is still coal in Enugu. There is mm -hmm. coal in Enugu. If you mm -hmm. are to be having this conversation in the 40s, 50s, perhaps I will be this passionate about coal in Enugu. But see how Very the world has moved away. There is a risk that the world will move away from fossil fuel. And we are beginning to see the impact of technology. Today, I mean, I was in, in Portugal trying to sell LNG. And this was a company that also is very big 
in power in, uh, in the Latin South America. So as a patriotic Nigeria, I said to them, how about you come into Nigeria and set up, even if it's a two gigawatts plant, and let's see mm -hmm. if there's a new business opportunity between Nigeria LNG, or in fact, Nigeria as a whole, because most likely it will be uh, on land upstream to That's generate right. additional power. We are struggling, but 200 million people scrambling for less than uh, 5,000 5, megawatts. Megawatts, yeah. And, and he, he shot me, Frank, and he said, two things I will say to you. First of all, there is a moratorium on us not to invest in anything fossil fuel fired power. Incredible. I was shocked. He then called my attention to the World Bank and perhaps the IMF, who have put a stake in the ground not to finance anything linked to oil. Countries are making such statements. So we cannot sit back and bury our heads in sand believing that we have this oil, we have this oil. The relevance of oil is waning. Yes, mm. gas is also going to struggle, but gas is cleaner and gas is the bridging fuel. So gas is that transition fuel yeah. that potents the opportunity for us to play. And we are lucky to have this resource. So in terms of the energy transition, renewables will grow much faster, but gas mm -hmm. will continue to be relevant. And in the mix, sure. the forecast is that it will be about 25%. But there's mm -hmm. one new source of energy that is coming that scares me even more than what we see with solar today. It's called hydrogen. Mm -hmm. and on the back of technology, Hydrogen is looking like the energy of the future. None of us saw it coming. A country like Japan, which has no resource and is so reliant on my LNG, is today spending a lot of money to develop hydrogen and become independent. Look at what happened in the United States. Once the share revolution came up, they became mm -hmm. independent. Look at yes. the impact on Nigeria. Look at the impact on the market. I recall we used to sell massive volumes of oil to the United States, more than what is a million barrels per day to the United yeah. States. Today, I don't think you sell almost up to 200,000 barrels a day to them because they don't need it anymore. So yes. the world is becoming independent. Yes. The world is moving away from conventional fuels, but gas will, begin, will continue to be relevant. And we have gas. So I think... As I said, it's time for gas. It's time for that focus on gas to just prepare this country for that future where energy has to be clean. Very, very insightful. And, 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 and I think it is quite important that we're having this conversation today. We probably should have been having this conversation 10 years ago, but as they say, it's better late than never. Um, we are, without any question, better prepared today for the kind of energy transition that we now face as a country and indeed as, 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 as a world. So there would be absolutely no excuse if we are not right there at the get-go uh, taking advantage of these transitions, transitions that are happening. Let me ask you my final question this morning, Tony. Uh, Nigeria LNG is a major exporter of liquefied natural gas uh, and of course, uh, liquefied uh, natural gas uh, liquid uh, across the world. What is the company doing to deepen LNG and LNG utilization in the country in all its ramifications? We are a major enabler, Frank, uh, as okay. I said. Um, today, Nigeria produces, if you go by the count uh, from the GMD, about 8, bi 8 billion uh, cubic feet of gas per day, 8 BCF of gas. At Nigeria LNG, we require 3.5 BCF of that. So almost half of the gas producing country today, we provide home for. Adding for me, that yes. is a major, major opportunity because you enable the upstream to continue to develop uh, for more, more gas. But yes. I think... On the back of our vision, which I said we have an ambidextrous vision of staying global, staying competitive in the global space, staying as mm -hmm. one of the leading LNG companies in the world. But yes. the, on the right hand side is helping to build a better nation. And yes. part of our contribution is really in the LPG space. Uh, by 2007, Nigeria had only 50,000 tons of LPG capacity in the country, 50,000. And on a per capita basis, it was less than one. 
where countries like Ghana were already four, Morocco was mm. 16, Senegal was mm. 17, and the per capita place is per kg wow. of consumption. But Nigeria LNG got involved on the invitation of the uh, then president to say, we need some of these in country. And since then we have enabled that sector to grow. We were about 80% market share, but because of the enablement, we sort of created very clear environment for gas development in the LPG space. And today we contribute what is about 350,000 tons into country. And the capacity of LPG in the country today at the end of this year will be a million tons. Wow. One million tons. But it's not, that's not all. We carried out a study working with the office of the vice president to say, what does it mean, as you've asked the question, to deepen the penetration of LPG in Nigeria? And that study yes. returned that the true capacity of LPG consumption in Nigeria is 3 million tons per annum. Wow. So you can see how much space there is there in terms of opportunity. Just last week, I went back to board to say, you gave me a ceiling of 350,000 tons. This year, I will deliver 380,000 tons. Can you increase wow. my capacity to 450 to 500? The board has just approved that we should bring 450,000 tons into country. Again, further enabling that. But I think wow. by far on the back of contributing cleaner energy is the social health side of things. We have on record that about 4 million people die on an annual basis from indoor smoke inhalation, mostly trying to put food on the table. Mm. In Nigeria, that horrible number is 100,000 women and mostly children just what trying to put food on the table. And we say we must change that narrative. As yes, Nigeria. Yes, yes. Nobody deserves to die just because they want to put food on the table. And that is partly why we are so inspired to continue to bring more of LPG into Nigeria to preserve forex and reduce the, the, the need for kerosene, reduce the deforestation, help with mm -hmm. the uh, uh, eliminating desertification. Yes. I, I think that is a major contribution from Nigeria LNG, which a lot of times uh, is not very public, but also yes. recognizing the uh, huge gap in the power infrastructure and the pipelines we talked about we are currently uh, working a project to bring some domestic LNG into country. As you would expect, a lot of it will be ar around the coastal fronts because that's where our ships can get to. But most importantly, being able to bring some domestic LNG into country as a bridge until the pipeline infrastructures uh, referenced by the GMD are in place. And then we can go back to exporting whatever that volume is. But by far the biggest support for us is in the social health preservation of lives and making sure that cleaner energy uh, sources are available to our people in Nigeria. And that is how we continue to help build a better Nigeria at Nigeria LNG. What a very hopeful and positive note to end our conversation, Tony. Let me thank you so very much. Uh, for Thank bringing uh, exceeding light to bear on a number of very complicated and complex issues, and perhaps more importantly, for providing hope in, ter in terms of expanding uh, uh, LPG availability and utilization in Nigeria, but also for the very promising intervention uh, in uh, uh, LNG transportation in country. Uh, please, we thank you so very much and wish you the very best. We would like at some point um, to see that LNG uh, uh, being transported, as you said, across uh, the coastal uh, 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 